Hello and welcome back to All the Words She Wrote. Last time we got a bit of an introduction, met our heroine and yeah, let's just continue. The weekend passes in the blink of an eye and soon the fated day TM is upon me. I awake on Monday bright and early, then splash my face with cool water in the bathroom. I clean my teeth, brush my hair and pull on a cute outfit I prepared the night before. I already packed my bag in advance with some of the essentials I'll need to spend the night away. Hijiri lives in the countryside, in a small, remote village. It takes four hours, give or take, to arrive at her village, with three changes along the way, and that's without factoring in all the time spent waiting for connections. Since so few trains stop at Hijiri's village, Sae determined it was unfeasible for me to make a round trip in one day. Sae decided, instead, that I should stay the night with Hijiri, regardless of whether or not she agrees to take me on as a housekeeper. I'm sorry, it's such an awkward arrangement, Mayo. Sae apologized to me the other day, while we were hammering out the finer points of my schedule. I'd pay to put you up in a hotel, but there aren't any in the immediate area. Hijiri's village is really out of the way. Fortunately, her home is more than large enough to accommodate you. I'll tell her to prepare a guest bedroom. I know she has several. Is that all right? Naturally, I reassured Sae that everything was A-OK. -okay. That's totally fine. I don't mind spending the night with Hijiri. I'll have to get used to living under her roof if she does hire me. And if she doesn't, it'll still be a fun experience. Though it would be somewhat bittersweet. I don't just want to spend one night in Hijiri's care. I want to spend the rest of my life with her. Wow, aren't we moving a bit fast here? <laughs> I mean, I get that you idolize her, but... Mm. Just kidding, ha! Huh. Realistically speaking, it'd be a bummer to spend the night with Hijiri only to pack my bags and go home the next day. But I'm hoping that won't happen. With some luck, my unerring love for Elf Forest should shine through during my job interview. Yeah, again, I'm not sure if being a fan is really the best mm, basis on becoming an employee, but okay. I'll do anything for you, Miss Mistress Hijiri, I'll tell her. I'll even lick the dirt from your feet if that is what you want. If only you'll permit me to remain in your august presence. I think that should do the trick. I'll make my devotion so apparent Hijiri will have no choice but to hire me. I don't want to count my chickens before they hatch, but I'm feeling quietly confident about my chances. Well, not if you go through with what you just uh, said. Huh. I'm glad you're in such high spirits. I distinctly remember Saa saying that while we were discussing things. You'll need to take a change of clothes with you in, on your trip, but don't bother packing too much. It'll be a hassle to haul a huge suitcase around, and you mightn't be staying more than a night. Bring the bear, bring the bare essentials. If Hijiri does give you the job, I can deliver you the rest of your things in my car later if you need them. That's the advice Sara gave me, which I think was pretty prudent. There's no chance Hijiri won't hire me, of course. I'm trying to think positively. But I don't much want to haul all my clothes around with me. The journey ahead of me is a long, complex one, full of changes. Lugging around large suitcases on public transport is always a nightmare. Ah, uh, you tell me, after staying 10 months in Japan and having to get all my stuff back somehow. <laughs> oh well. I don't want any of my fellow passengers tutting at me. 
Moreover, I'll have to walk a bit to get to Hijiri's home. She lives on the outskirts of her village, about a 20 minute walk away from the station, down a cruddy, twisty, turny countryside road. I know, because Saya te texted me over the details last night. It's a sultry summer's day, and carting a massive wheeled case around with me for almost half an hour would make me sweat. It's in my interest to put my best foot forward when meeting Hichiri. I want to make a good first impression. Reading her all red faced and out of breath absolutely will not cut it. That would be a total disaster. And not something that's totally expected if someone was uh, traveling half the day. Packing light is, indisputably, the way to go. It's the best way to ward off any unfortunate happenings. That's what I think, at least, but my mother seems less convinced. Are you sure you have everything you need for your trip? That bag looks awfully small. I have everything I need, ma'am. Don't worry. I can't help but worry. I'm your mother. Did you remember to bring a change of underwear? Of course, mom. I'm not a child. And what about your phone? Your wallet? Your keys? Check, check and check. All the important stuff's in this pouch at the front. I pat my messenger bag for good measure, which is resting on the chair beside me. My dad isn't here to see me off. He had to head to the office early, to sort out some work-related emergency. He did say goodbye before he left though, and wished me luck. My dad's pretty chill. I wish my mother could follow in his example, but... You put all your valuables in that front pouch? My mother's look of disapproval deepens. That doesn't sound very safe. You'll be a prime target for pickpockets. You should put your purse somewhere more secure. It'll be fine, Mom. I've used this bag a lot and I've never been pickpocketed before. Maybe not, but there's a first time for everything. Move your purse at least, Mayo. Sure, sure. I acquiesce to my mother's wishes, as I often do when she gets on my case. It's easier to do what she says rather than argue things out. I don't want to get into a fight over something so petty. There, I moved my purse. Is that better? Marginally. I'm not sure why you brought that messenger bag though, when we have that wheeled travel bag. It's bigger and there's more compartments. Wouldn't you rather use that? I thought about it, but I'm not bringing that much stuff. Besides, it's so big, it's a pain to cart around on the trains. Well, whatever you say. I'm sure you know best. My mother sniffs in a way that suggests she doesn't really think I know best. She's good at being passive-aggressive. If it was an Olympic sport, I'm sure she'd win a gold medal. And you have your toothbrush, toothpaste, your hairbrush? Yes, mother. Your phone charger. Hmm. Oh, mm hmm. And you know exactly what trains you have to catch? So I sent me an itinerary yesterday. I've looked at it so many times, I've got it memorized. Do you want me to recite it? That won't be necessary. I'll try to have faith in you. Gee, that makes a change. No, no, don't take the tone with me, young lady. I'm just looking out for you. You should be grateful. This is the best job opportunity you've ever had. I don't want you squandering it by getting on the wrong train and ending up in, I don't know, some rice paddy somewhere. That would be disastrous. I won't, up. I won't end up in a rice paddy, mom. Though I'm sure I'll pass them on my journey. 
He did his home his way out in the sticks. That's an interesting thought, come to think of it. I'm a city girl through and through, and I don't think I've ever seen a real rice paddy before. I know of rice as something you can buy in bulk at the supermarket, in these huge 5 kilogram bags. I eat rice almost every single day, at breakfast and at dinner, but I've never seen it out in the wild. It would have been better if Sa could have driven you there instead. My mother laments with a sigh. Then I wouldn't have to worry about your sense of direction, or lack of. It's a shame she was so busy this morning. It'll be fine. And I'll be fine too, I promise. I don't need Auntie Sai to hold my hand. I'm not a baby. I can handle myself just fine. I hope you're right. My mother shakes her head and looks at the food arranged on the table. She always goes all out with breakfast. She says it's the most important meal of the day, but she made even more of it than usual today. This lavish feast must be on account of my upcoming journey. She's trying to, store, to shore up my stamina. It's nice of her, but... Aren't you going to eat, Mayo? You've barely touched your food. I'm not very hungry. I've been pecking at bits and pieces of food like a bird, but I can't taste any of it. The white rice, fresh from the cooker, might as well be cotton balls, the miso soup water. I'm so keyed up, it's a real effort to make myself swallow. My stomach feels like it's full of fluttering butterflies. I feel like a teenage girl in love, psyching herself up before confessing to her crush. In a sense, I am a girl in love. I absolutely adore Elf Forest, and I adore the author who created it. Tsuchimirui, or Komikaru Hijiri, is my favorite artist of all time. Her work never fails to make me smile. Being able to see her at all feels like a dream. Everything pales in comparison to my eager expectations. The sight of my ordinary kitchen, the smell of the fried mackerel my mother cooked, the taste of a nourishing miso soup. It's nothing but background noise. Really, I want to be up and out the door ASAP. I can't wait to finally meet my idol. There's no chance Hijiri will love me as much as I love her, but I hope she at least likes me. That would make not only my year, but my entire life. Well, fingers crossed. We have reached our final destination where this train terminates. We advise all passengers to check their belongings before stepping off the train. Once again, we have reached our final destination. Finally! Thank goodness! I sling my messenger bag over my shoulder, which was lying on the unoccupied seat beside me, and get to my feet. I've been sitting for so long, my legs feel numb. Pins and needles shoot through my body and the soles of my feet are tingling. I'm in such a hurry to get off the train, I stumble. Fortunately, I'm able to ride myself before I go tumbling to the ground like a clown. That'd be a pretty sucky way to end my journey. Though, even if I had fallen, it wouldn't have mattered that much. My face might have taken a bit of a bruising, but my pride would remain more or less intact. It's not like there's anybody else in the train compartment to judge me for my clumsiness. I'm the only person here. There were a few people sitting with me during the prior stops, but the last of them, a kindly looking old woman, got off at the previous station with a smile and a wave. For the final 20 minutes trundling through rice paddies, I had nobody for company save me, myself and I. It made for quite the relaxing journey, but it was also kinda weird. I've lived in Kawasaki all my life, which is a stone's throw away from Tokyo, 
It's not in Tokyo proper, but the trains are always jam-packed with businessmen and women, regardless of the hour. I've never had a whole train compartment to myself before. I never even considered that such a thing was possible. It really felt, during those final 20 minutes, like I was being spirited away into a different dimension, a dream world. Now, I feel all disoriented. Time doesn't seem to be functioning as it should. I fish my phone out of my pocket, then check it once, w once I step off the train. I set off at 8.15 and now it's 2.05 on the dot. Where did all that time go? It feels like it's vanished. I was supposed to arrive a little after one, but my travels took longer than anticipated. There was a hold-up during the last leg of the journey. The train was halted for half an hour, apparently because a wild zero had been spotted hanging out on the tracks. The train had to break, so the zero would be shooed away to safety. I have no idea what kind of animal that is. Hmm. Chain delays aren't uncommon occurrences in and around Tokyo, but they're never caused by wild animals, let alone zero. I don't think the businessmen I see over in the KQ Kawasaki line would much appreciate having their schedules disrupted in such a way. The handful of people waiting in my compartment didn't seem to mind too much, though. The youngish woman to my left continued reading her paper bag, and the older woman behind me struck up a conversation with me. She asked me where I was going and what my plans were, and she offered me a candy. She was like your stereotypical kind grandma. I wondered briefly why nobody seemed more frustrated at this long delay in the service, but then I figured they were probably used to it. Time seems to pass more slowly out in the countryside. People take things at their own pace. They live among the mountains and the forests, coexisting with nature, and sometimes wild deer or zero get in the way, but you've got to learn to accept it. That is the circle of life. Or something like that. The journey wasn't too bad, I guess, but I feel relieved to finally get off the train. Now I can finally meet Hijiri. All my dreams are on the cusp of coming true. Really, though... Sai so wasn't kidding when she said this place was remote. I stuff my phone back into my pocket, then look about the train station. It's so rundown, calling it dilapidated would be a kindness. The station building is this tiny thing made of wood with a sagging roof that doesn't look safe to be any merit doesn't look safe by any metric. I think one good gust of wind would be enough to reduce it to firewood. When was this place built anyway? Nineteen hundred? There's absolutely no way it would pass a modern health and safety check. The platform I'm standing on, meanwhile, is equally uninspiring. It's basically barren, besides one lone wooden bench, which I wouldn't sit on if you paid me. The screws holding the bench together are rusty with age, and it looks ready to fall apart. There's a sign next to the bench with the village's name emblazoned on it. It's the most modern thing about this train station, but that's not saying much. What is it? Q Shirataki? Okay. The sign's all discolored from age, and it's hard to pick out the individual characters beneath all the accumulated grime. As far as signs go, it's completely useless. There's no way I'd be able to read it from the train. The station's so tiny, it only has one train track. The track's all overgrown with weeds and tall grass, which is pushing up through the gaps in the rails. 
I wonder how many trains the station sees a day. Maybe one or two? I can't imagine they get much traffic. It's a wonder a station this clearly underfunded and underused is still open. It seems like a mess of money sink. That reminds me of that one train station that only had a train... Like, um... Only twice a day a train would come to that station and it was only for one student. <laughs> like they wanted to, to close the station or... Not the whole train line, it, it must have been the station, but they decided to keep it open until the student graduated from school. Oh, I think it's a fun story. And I assume by now the station is closed. Oh. I'm lucky to be living uh, quite central in the city, so I won't have this kind of problem. I think it's a real inconvenience with uh, yeah, public transport being this rare, but yeah. Of course, countryside has its own benefits, but it's not for me. Oh well, I'm still grateful it exists. If it weren't for the station, it'd be even harder for me to meet up with Hijiri. I'd have to take a bunch of buses instead, out into the sticks, or I'd have to hire a car, which comes with its own complications. This is pretty convenient, the wild zero aside, though it does make me wonder. How does anybody live out here without going crazy? It's so cut off from the rest of the world. The nearest town's like 20 minutes away, and that's by train. I bet the roads here are awful, and if the station's anything to go by, I can't imagine there's much to see. I doubt there's in any real shops, even. I pull a face. You'd have to be a crazy recluse to willingly live out here. Now, I wonder what that says about Hijiri. That's what I was thinking. Oh, wow. This place is even deader than I thought it'd be. I wander aimlessly through the streets, my messenger bag slung over my shoulder. I've been walking for about 10 minutes now, and I've yet to detect any signs of life. The train station was deserted, and the rest of the village seems to be following suit. I haven't passed any dog walkers or joggers or families out enjoying the sun. It's so ominously quiet, I can hear the pounding of my own heart. Its repetitive thrumming mingles with the plaintive cries of the cicadas secreted away in the undergrowth and the regular slapping of my shoes against the dirt. I've passed several houses on my track, but I haven't seen anybody lingering outside. This place is like a ghost town or village, in this case. What's the population... Sorry. What's the population meant to be like anyway? Sai did tell me... Is it 400? 300? These numbers are shockingly low as it is, but I'm fast starting to suspect the real number is a neat round zero. Naturally, I've not come across any shops since I left the station. Not even a small, rundown convenience store with a humming cooler filled of popsicles set up outside. I could sure go for a popsicle, or maybe an ice cream. The summer heat is relentless. I can feel it bearing down upon the crown of my head and my shoulders, so heavy it feels like a cloak. Sweat beads on my forehead, and my shirt is beginning to stick to me. I feel gross. I spent hours picking out my outfit last night, and for what? I don't want to turn up at Hichiri's house looking like a dirty, dusty vagrant. It would make an awful impression. Again, I don't think anyone expects you to look, like, perfect after traveling half the day. I'm starting to fret. 
But I know if my mother was here, she'd chide me for my concerns. You're putting the horse before the cart, Mario. Worry about finding Hijidi's home first, before working yourself into a state about meeting her. The imaginary mother who dwells inside my head is right, of course. Well, I wish she wouldn't nag me so much. I've been following the directions given to me by my unquestionable overlord, the almighty map app which shall not be named, but it's not been helping very much. The little icon that's supposed to represent me keeps spinning around, like it's being rung through the washing machine, no matter how I try to orient myself. I feel discombobulated. I'm unsure if I'm going in the right direction, and it doesn't help that the roads around here don't seem to have any names. Central Tokyo can be confusing, sure, with all its high-rise buildings and its myriad branching walkways, but at least the city planners have the decency to label everything. Well, everything? I'm not sure about that. I'm not the best at directions, but I can get around easily enough. The numerous train stations, spaced apart a couple of miles away from each other, if that, help a lot. Unfortunately, there aren't any stations out here, other than the one I disembarked from. There don't seem to be any landmarks either, unless the old, disused telephone box on my right counts. I pause and check my phone for further guidance, but it doesn't help. The little me icon on my map app is still freaking out, though I'm standing stuck still. This village is so old-fashioned, almost antiquated, it seems to actively repel technology. My phone feels pretty incongruous when compared with some of the more old-fashioned homes I've come across. There are a handful of modern houses, yeah, but a bunch of them look like something plucked straight from the Meiji era. At this point, I don't think I'd bat an eyelid if a contingent of samurai... Am I using the right collective? Walked on by. Stupid thing, why won't you work? I shake my phone as though this might chuck my map up into behaving itself. Of course, it doesn't. The little icon that's supposed to depict me keeps right on spinning. Are you drunk or something? I click my tongue. Maybe there's like some kind of magic barrier set up around this place. Or maybe I really have gone back in time? I know the most likely culprit behind my phone's non-compliance is this body signal. This place really is in the middle of nowhere. But it's more fun to consider fantastical explanations. Magic or no, I really do feel lost. I wonder if this is how Itsuki felt when he was hit by that truck. When he came to in Crystaria, he was all dazed and confused. It took Itsuki a while to get accustomed to his surroundings, but at least he had Princess Luluna to help him. <sighs> Itsuki's so lucky. I sigh and scuff the ground with my foot. I wish Luluna would help me too. Heck, at this point I'd even consider forming a party with Astra or Luz, though neither of them are in my strike zone. They're cute enough, though, and they're pretty helpful. Astra's tendency to blow hot and cold notwithstanding. Why can't you just be honest with her feelings towards Itsuki? It's been eight volumes. She should hurry up and confess to him, so Itsuki can turn her down with a gentle smile and a kind... I'm sorry, but actually, there's somebody else I have feelings for. Astra's fans might not appreciate that, but it's obvious that's where the story's going to go. Luluna's been set up as Itsuki's lover from day one. Luluna's the main cause. The other girls are side dishes who exist to spruce up the meal. Astra and Luz and Cornelia and Vita. Speaking of side dishes, I'm starting to get hungry. I bought a pre-made lunch on the train, 
But I was so worked up I could only pick at it. My stomach's rumbling, my brow's sweating, and my phone still refuses to cooperate. I'm supposed to meet Hijiri around twen around 2.30, and it's already 2.20. No, 2.21. I only have nine minutes left. I'm not late just yet, but things will end up that way if I don't hurry up. Now I'm really starting to panic. I tried to reposition myself, myself once more using my phone, but... Uh, it's all in vain. It's not working. I thought you got directions from Sai. Like, why do you necessarily need, need an app? And I mean, not having signal out here is kind of expected, right? Eh, oh well. Alright, fine. It's not like I needed your help anyway. I turn off my phone, then stuff it back into my pocket with a grumpy harumph. If my phone won't respect me, I won't respect it. I'm through with playing nice. I'll just have to find Tijiri's home on my own. It'd be nice if there was a kindly passing pedestrian who could point me in the right way, or a convenience store I could duck into to ask for directions. But I'm out of luck. There's nobody in this tiny village, as I've already ascertained, and convenience stores seem to be a thing of mere myth. This village is many things, but it's not, as I've come to learn, remotely convenient. It'll be hard going at it alone, with nothing but my terrible sense of direction to rely on, but I'm sure it'll work out. These things always do, in the end. This village is so small, I'm sure I'll stumble upon Hidiri's home eventually. It's unlikely I'll get lost. What's the worst that could happen? Famous last words? Ten minutes later. Where in the world am I? I've only been working for a little while, but somehow I'm even more lost than I was before. Will I ever be able to make my way back to human civilization? This might be the end of the line for me. Even if I do escape from all these creepy sunflowers, a quick glance at my phone tells me that I'm already late for my meeting with Hidiri. There's no way she'll ever hire me now. Forget about making good first impression, or even a passable one. I haven't come face to face with my idol yet, and I've already blown my chance. My, mom th my mother was right to worry about me. I really am stupid. What am I going to do now? An hour later. <laughs> Am I finally here? Is this really Hijiri's home? After a good amount of backtracking and no shortage of getting lost, I finally find myself in front of a facade which might, quite possibly, belong to the famous light novel author Tsuchimi Rui. Or, ahem, <clears throat> Komikado Hijiri. I've got to try and remember that. It'll be awkward if I get Rui's, I mean Hijiri's, name wrong. As I said, ask her what she prefers. The number on the front of the house matches the address Sai gave me, as does the general description. But jeez, this place is way more ornate than I imagined. Hijiri's house, if indeed it is Hijiri's house, towers over me. Two impressive floors, all done in a traditional Japanese style, with a black tile roof and a load of lat latticed windows. The house isn't just tall either, it's freaking wide. I'm not a gambling, gambling person, but I bet you could fit my parents' teeny tiny Kawasaki home into this floor plan twice over. How many rooms does this place have? How many sliding doors? If the interior is as traditional as the exterior, 
it'll probably have a pretty open floor plan with spacious tatami rooms, but even so. This place doesn't look like a house at all. Not by my metric, at least, as a city dweller. It looks way more than like an inn, or maybe a hot springs resort. There's got to be room in there for a karaoke booth, plus a bunch of ping pong tables. Now I feel like I should look around for a vending machine or two. A bottle of chilled sodas, just what I need to ease my parched throat. I glance about, but of course, I find no such dispensary of soft drinks. That figures. What person would put a vending machine in their garden? Well, people with too much money would, I'm sure. <laughs> Hitiri's house. Is it her house? Has a lot of garden. The house is wrapped up in it, like a gift in a box. All swaying grass and what I think might be hinoki trees, festooned with green leaves. I've never seen any house like this before, not outside of period dramas. It really does feel like I've stepped back in time. When were houses like this common? It has a real Meiji era look to it, like the village it's, suited, it, it's situated in, but I doubt many people had houses like this even way back when. It's way too extravagant. An average family never would have been able to afford something like this. This is like a real samurai residence. I wouldn't be surprised to learn some feudal warlord had lived here centuries past, ruling it over all, ruling it over all the little people. This place is amazing, but it's also kind of intimidating. I can hardly believe Hijiri has been living in this place all alone for years. Doesn't she ever get freaked out at night? I would. The house is massive, all stuffed full of history, and it doesn't help that the back garden borders a crap load of spooky forests. I don't believe in ghost stories, but this place is giving me the shivers, and it's broad daylight. I am back, perturbed. But no, I can't afford to get cold feet. Not now. I'm late enough as it is. I was supposed to get here almost two hours ago. HTD will be wondering where in the world I am. It's probably too late to make a good first impression, but even making a bad first impression is better than making no impression. I've got this. I can do it. I inhale, trying to steady myself and head for what I think is the front door. Hello? I rap upon the wood, which is goodness knows how many years old, my heart in my throat all the while. Hello, Miss Komikado? Are you there? I knock and I knock, but I receive no response. The house is as silent as an old black and white movie. The only sounds I can hear are the cicadas, humming in the multitudes in the forest, and a few twittering birds. This isn't doing much to plug in my nerves. Let me try again. Miss Komikado? I knock again, louder this time, but still, I hear nothing. There are no footsteps beyond the front door, no clicking of the lock. I frown. Did she step out? Sai should have told her I was coming, but I did take an awfully long time to get here. Maybe she got tired of waiting? There's also the possibility that, this house being as huge as it is, Hijiri simply can't hear me, not if she's in one of the upstairs rooms. I wonder how well sound travels in this place. I shift from foot to foot, the back of my t-shirt stuck to my damp, sweat slicked body. The sunlight continues to beat down upon me. It's merciless. I feel like asking it if it didn't mind taking a hike for, like, half an hour, so as I can get my act together, but I know that'd be pointless. 
It's not like the sun has the capacity, capacity to listen to me. I must already look like a crazy person, muttering to myself like this, without launching into a one-way argument with the sun. I guess it's a good thing nobody else is around, other than the cicadas. This place really is quiet. It's eerie. What should I do now? There's no point standing around here. Not if EGD isn't there to let me in. I'm just wasting time while slowly getting sunburned. It did seem a shame to turn back though, after coming this far. I don't want my journey to go to waste, and I absolutely can't pass up the chance to meet Tsuchimirui. This is a bit of a long shot, but... Hoping against hope, I reach out for the door handle. I give it a tuck and, to my surprise... What? Really? It offers no resistance. The door opens inwards, allowing me access into Hijiri's home. No way. I blink, taken aback. I can't believe that worked, and so easily too. For a few moments, I dither helplessly by the front door. I didn't jimmy it open, Hijiri, Hijiri left it unlocked, but heading inside would feel like a step too far. I don't want to trespass in Hijiri's, on Hijiri's private property. This place is so old, it probably has a ghost or two. Angering the restless spirit seems like a pretty good way to go about getting cast. Not that I believe in ghosts, of course. It's all nonsense. I should be vastly more concerned about Hijiri herself. What if she holds this against me? Entering our home uninvited doesn't seem like a great way to make her acquaintance, but I guess I've already messed up on account of being so late. Can things get any worse? I don't think so. Really, I try to reason with myself, I have no choice. I've got a job interview to get to, which can hardly go ahead if my host refuses to answer the door. It's not like I'm stopping by unannounced. He duly knew I'd be coming here. I'm not a trespasser, and I'm definitely not a thief. My motives are pure. I've nothing to feel guilty about, and I don't want to keep hanging around outside. The heat is intense. Alright, Mayo. I slap my cheeks with my damp, sweaty palms in an attempt to psych myself up. You can do this. Don't chicken out now. I let my arms fall to my sides, then square my shoulders. I raise my head. Then, with a purposeful in in inhalation of air, I take my first step inside Hijiri's home. The interior of her home is just as spacious as the exterior, and just as dated. The ancient hall is floored with smooth wooden planks, and the ceiling is supported by wooden beams. This place might be large enough to function as an inn, but there's no check-in counter by the double doors. It's definitely a person's home. The shoes by the door and the coats on the rack attest to that much, but it's nothing like any home I've ever been in before. It really does resemble a samurai's residence. Wow! I exhale, enchanted by my surroundings. I wonder how old this place is. I feel like I should be paying a fee to look around here. Well, you can pay in work if you're lucky. I bend, then slide my shoes off at the front door, next to a pair of beaten up sneakers which, presumably, belong to Hijiri. These off-white shoes, scuffed from years of wear, look very out of place in the otherwise pristine entrance hall, as do the coats on the rack. If it wasn't for these choice items, the house would look almost unlived in. 
I'm starting to wonder, as I glance about the entrance hall, whether anybody does live here. I can't hear any sounds of life, only the faint humming of the cicadas outside. Where could my enigmatic host be? Maybe she'll appear if I call for her, like you would a cat. Here, here, Judy. Come on, girl. Don't be shy. I won't bite. Come on. Yeah, maybe not. It seems unlikely. I banished that thought from my mind while walking through the hallway. I can see a whole bunch of sliding doors lining the hall, all of them tightly shut. I can't hear any noises emanating from beyond them. I don't think Hichiri is on the ground floor. Maybe she's upstairs? I double back on myself to the grand staircase in the entrance hall and head up. Now on the second floor, I pause to scan my surroundings. The hallway up here is wooden too, with windows inlaid into the walls at various intervals. Sunshine spills into the hall, casting squares of light against the floorboards and the cream walls. This house looks pretty clean from what I can gather, but not in the way my parents' home does. It's too clean to feel truly lived in. Less a home and more a diorama. I do see, however, when I pass a window, that the sills are thick with dust. They need a good swipe, a good wipe down, and the window panes themselves are grimy. When was the last time they had proper cleaning? I make a mental inventory of all the chores that need doing as I search. All the doors here, like those downstairs, are shut. I can't hear any noise beyond them. Maybe Hichiri really isn't here. Or maybe she's asleep? I frown. This is getting ridiculous. If I'm to find Hichiri, I should probably launch a more thorough investigation. Now feeling like a detective at a crime scene, I approach the nearest door. I press my fingers into the shallow indentations on his left side and draw it back. So the thing is, with a house so, so big, of course it could be that she didn't hear you if you were at the front door. But trying doors inside instead of maybe shouting or like, you, you know, calling out to them again. Maybe that might help, instead of just opening doors here. <laughs> but okay. The door slides open with ease to reveal an empty room, all plain tatami floors and a few empty bookshelves. The tatami is aged and faded from sunlight and it's spotted here and there with stains. The mats could use a good clean, or else a complete replacement, but the room itself is barren. It's a bit depressing, actually. And, of course, Hijiri isn't there. I close the door behind me, then try another. It's the same story here, however, just bare tatami. I tell myself that the third time is a charm and move on to the next room. This door slides open as easily as the rest. But the room beyond it couldn't be more different. This is the only room in the whole house, thus far, which is obviously lived in, and quite thoroughly at that. The curtains in the room are drawn, which lends it a dim, dreary appearance. It takes my eyes a few moments to adjust to the murk, but when they do, I gasp. The floor is tatami, or at least I think it is, it's hard to tell, given it's scattered with detritus, empty food packages, plates and discarded clothes. There's a table set up in one corner of the room, with two computer monitors and a fancy keyboard resting on it. There's a bin beneath it, this table, which is overflowing with yet more trash. There's a bed in the corner of the room, its sheet rumpled, and, lying upon the bed, I can see a young woman.
The woman's wear wearing a baggy tracksuit which obscures m much of her body and her cheek is pushed against her pillow. She doesn't stir even as I swim my way through the garbage ocean to her side. She's still and unresponsive, like a doll. Or maybe, I think with a shiver, a corpse. Oh my goodness. A soft exclamation falls from my lips. It doesn't quite sum up the seriousness of the situation or the intensity of the emotions I'm currently feeling. There is something very, very wrong with this woman. Her stillness seems almost unnatural. Maybe she was robbed. That'd explain the unlocked front door and the messy room. I've seen scrap yards more orderly than this. Trespassers must have broken into Hichiri's home. They crept into her room and knocked her unconscious, or worse. Then they tore through her drawers, taking all the valuables valuables they could. Is that what happened? It doesn't sound too unlikely. If that is the case, I should call the police. Or maybe an ambulance? What would be for the best? When did all this happen anyway? What if I'm too late? He did he. I descend upon the hopefully only comatose and probably not dead woman lying on the bed, who I now suspect is my potential future employer and the author of my favorite light novel series. Hijiri, are you alright? Answer me! I have enough self-awareness to ponder, though vaguely, it's probably a bit rude addressing Hijiri with such familiarity upon our first meeting but manners don't seem to matter too much. Corpses are notoriously non-picky about the way they're spoken to. Oh please, don't let her be a corpse. Just let her be concussed. If I've learned anything from the crime dramas my dad likes, it's that the people who find the corpses are always high on the list of potential suspects. I must look super suspicious. Especially since I let myself into Hijiri's home. What if Hijiri really is dead and I'm suspected of being the killer? I could go to prison over this. I don't want my life to be ruined. Hijiri, please, wake up! Hijiri! My fingers sink into Hijiri's slender shoulders. I shake her heart, as one might a rag doll, until... Mm. A soft sound escapes from Hijiri's lips. It's a small sound, muffled by her sheets, but it is, unmistakably, a sound. She isn't dead after all. Oh, happy day! I won't have to call the police, and I won't get called in for questioning, and I won't end up in a cell. I'm so happy I could cry, or kiss Hijiri, or both. Hijiri! Oh, thank goodness, thank goodness! Huh? What? Hijiri, Hijiri looks at me, only half awake. Who are you? I'm Mayo, Takaoka Mayo. I'm so glad you're alright. For a while there, I really thought you'd kick the bucket. I don't know what I'd do if you died. I don't want to go to prison. I can't get incarcerated before Elpharis ends. <laughs> Priorities. I want to know who Itsuki ends up with. It'll be Princess Luluna, right? Some people prefer Astra, but they're all wrong. Astra's cute, yeah, but she doesn't have the same chemistry with Itsuki that Luluna does. You agree with me, don't you, Hijiri? I'm sure you do. You're the one who made Princess Luluna after all. You must know how wonderful she is. Oh, Hijiri. My breath hitches in, in my chest. I was so consumed with the fear Hijiri might, you know, have croaked. 
it didn't really click that she's the author of Elf Forest. Not until now. If it wasn't for Hijiri, Princess Ludana wouldn't exist, and I'd be much unhappier for it. I owe this woman a great debt. How can I tell her how much I love her? I'm no author, not like Hijiri, and words just aren't enough. Oh, Hijiri, I'm so glad to meet you, and I'm really glad you're not dead. I reach out, overwhelmed, meaning to pull my idol into a warm embrace. Get away from me, you creep. Stay back. But that, as it transpires, well, this was a huge mistake. Fijiri shuffles away from me, then draws back her fist. I see a streak of movement in the periphery of my vision, and then... Oof! There's a loud, sickening crack. It takes me a few moments to recognize that this crack comes from inside me, then a few moments more for the pain to register. Ow! Ow, ow, freaking ow! For such a diminutive woman, he did his shook and pack a punch. I guess this will be my future warning. Hijiri does not respond well to praise, and she certainly doesn't rep respond well to hugs. I'm going to be seeing stars for a week. Okay. Goodness me, that's quite the nasty bruise. Are you alright, Mayo? Against all odds, yeah, I think I'll live. I offer Sai a weak smile. My forehead's still smarting after Hichiri struck me, but it doesn't hurt quite as much as it did during the immediate aftermath. The pack of frozen peas Sai unearthed from Hichiri's freezer helped. I kept the peas pressed to my forehead for a good ten minutes, like a cold compress, until the peas started to thaw. The purpose served, the peas were thrown away. Sai asked Hichiri if she wanted to keep hold of them, but she harumphed, then shook her head and said, I can hardly eat them now, and they've been tainted. I took offense to that remark, but Sai didn't seem particularly surprised, only disappointed. I doubt you were planning to eat those peas anyway. I imagine they've been in your freezer for months. Now peeless, <laughs> but feeling decidedly unprincess-like, I'm sitting in Hijiri's spacious, spacious living room alongside Sai and Hijiri herself. So wait, um, I was wondering this earlier when Sai offered to take uh, more of Mayo's clothes to the house, but I assumed that was because she couldn't come here with her car today, but only later, like maybe next day or even later. But this is the same day. So if she's here, why couldn't she bring Mayo here by car from the start? Wouldn't that have been easier? Just wondering. I've yet to see my reflection in the mirror, but if Sa is to be believed, and I don't see why she'd lie to me, my altercation with Hijiri wasn't without consequences. Hijiri must have left quite the bruise. I wonder how big it is. I hope it's not so noticeable I can't cover it up with foundation. I doubt a large greenish-blue bruise smacked up in the middle of my forehead will do much to improve my looks. Girl, you have bangs, don't worry. What if it never fades away? Then I'll be ruined for marriage. Princess Ludana will never fall in love with me then. Oh, the humanity. It's a good thing I arrived when I did, before things could escalate further. I shudder to think what would have happened without me. 
Same here. <laughs> Hitty might be small, but she's no slouch. She decked me with all the force of a pro prize fighter. I was seriously frightened for my life. You saved me, Sai. I'm always happy to help. I'd feel terrible if you got hurt, Mayo. Though I fear it might be too late for that. It's alright. I already said. You don't need to worry about me. I'm tough. Doesn't your head hurt? Mm, kinda. But I'm sure it'll go away. I'm hard-headed, you know? Hmm. Sai presses her lips together, concerned. I hope you don't feel ob obliged to put up a front. You should tell me if you feel unwell, and I'll drive you to the nearest hospital. It's not a problem. We're like family, you and I. Gee, thanks. I'm getting all flustered. That's very nice of you, Sai, but really, it's fine. I'm as fit as a fiddle. It'll take more than a single right hook to take me down. I flash Sai a toothy grin and a peace sign, but it doesn't seem to reassure her. She tucks a few loose strands of hair behind her ear, then says, I hope you live. That would be difficult to explain to your parents. Mirko would never forgive me. She might thank you, actually, for doing her a favor. I know I annoy her. <laughs> I wonder why. I think I heard Hichidi mutter something, but when I glance at her, she's staring resolutely at the wall, her lips clamped shut. She hasn't said a word since Sai came to the rescue with a, with a pack of frozen peas, despite mine and Sai's probing. She's not even looking at me. The three of us might be sitting in the same room, but Hichiri feels very far away indeed. I peer at Hichiri's face. It's hard to get a read on her emotions from her expression alone. It's blank, like a sheet of unlined paper. Is she angry? Embarrassed? Socially awkward? Maybe I should try lightening the mood. Hey, Hijiri, you're not into boxing, are you? You nearly knocked my block off. I mean it as a joke, but it doesn't stick the landing. Hijiri's expression remains unwaver unwavering. Wavering? I always have issues with my W's and B's. She doesn't even try to smile. Hmm. She does, harumph, but that's as far as the reaction goes. It's not a particularly illuminating response, but it does clear a few things up. I don't think Hijiri's embarrassed about hitting me, and I don't think she's socially awkward either. I think she just plain hates me. Well, this is awkward. So, um... <clears throat> Sai clears her throat, then begins to speak. I know you two might have gotten off on the wrong foot. Or fist. But please, don't be too hasty in your judgments, Hijiri. I am sure this was all a misunderstanding. Please allow me to introduce you properly this time. This is Komikaru Hijiri otherwise known as Tsuchimirui. She's the author of the popular light novel series El Forest, as you already know. Sai gestures, gestures to Hichiri, who harumphs again. Her arms seem grafted together in a permanently crossed position, like that of a doll's. Her unchanging expression, too, is disconcertingly doll-like, as is the rest of her. I couldn't get a good look at Hijiri in her dingy bedroom, but she can't hide away in the sun-drenched living room. The first thing I noticed about Hijiri, once the pain in my forehead began to subside, 
is how very small she is. She's kneeling right now, so it's hard to get an accurate read on her proportions, but I'd be willing to bet that she's a good head shorter than I am, if not more. I'm not all that tall myself, I'm only 5'3", so Hijiri must be teeny tiny. I can't believe she breaks the 5 foot barrier. Her hair is caramel colored, and she wears a tight, it tied back in two messy buns, one slightly lower than the other. Most of her body is swathed in a baggy tracksuit, but I can see from her face and her hands that her complexion's much darker than mine is. We're currently in the middle of a heat wave, so it wouldn't be surprising if she had a tan, but Hijiri doesn't strike me as the outdoorsy type. She's much more down for the count than she is up and at him. Maybe she's only half Japanese? No nope, would go a waste to explaining her striking appearance. It's not like I can come out and ask that question though. That'd probably sound insensitive. I don't want Hijiri to hate me more than she does already. Speaking of which, I should really stop staring at her. So... Sai shifts. Is there anything you'd like to add to that, Hijiri? There's a long pause. Hijiri looks between Sai and I, her lips pressed into a thin line before replying. Not really. Right, um... I see Sai's shoulders deflate. She's normally so cool, but Hijiri's detachment has managed to shake even her. Don't you want to tell Mayo a bit about your routine, or what you're expecting from a housekeeper? I don't want a housekeeper. I want to be left alone. I know you do, but that's not feasible. We've both discussed this. You did say you'd consi consider hiring a housekeeper, remember? Yes, I remember, and I did consider it. I thought it mightn't be a bad idea initially, but... Hijiri looks me over. Her expression is downright scarfing. Do you really mean to palm me off with this girl? Is this a joke? What qualifications does she even have? I... I'm a hard worker. Are you now? HTD raises an eyebrow. Would your previous employers be prepared to attest to that? Maybe, uh... My voice trails away. I look at my knees and the tatami mats beneath them. Damn, Hijiri's sharp. Her words are even more cutting than a paring knife. Maybe not, no. But I'd work hard for your sake, Hijiri. I wouldn't slack off, I promise. Komikado, please. What? Call me Komikado. We're not nearly close enough for you to use my given name. We hardly know one another. M maybe you don't know me, Hiji. Sorry, Komikado. Jeez, that's a long family name. It's such a mouthful. Everything about Hiji thus far has been awkward. From her out of the way house to her hard to pronounce name. But I'm prepared to weather any storm if it'll get me closer to her. She can insult and denigrate me all she wants. I don't care. It won't change how I feel about her. But I know you. Really now? Hijiri looks unimpressed. I would ask whether you're a stalker, but that seems unlikely. Any stalker worth assault would, presumably, know where my house is without getting lost on the way there. Ouch, that stings. She has a point, but did she really have to face it like that? 
Speak up then. How do you know me? Did we meet in a dream? Not quite. I'm not crazy. <laughs> Though Nina might disagree. Let me introduce myself. I'll take it from the top. I'm Taka Okamayo. Auntie Sa is a friend of my family. She's not my real aunt, but I kinda see her as one. We're pretty close. <laughs> I'm 24 years old, my birthday's in June, which, which makes me a Gemini, and my blood type's AB. I like upbeat pop music and baking sweets and reading manga. I hardly ever read books and I never used to read light novels, but I saw the standee of Princess Ludona outside my local Kinokuniya a few years back and I was entranced. I bought all the Elforest volumes that were out because of Ludona and I've been a huge fan ever since. I see. He did his eyes. You're a fan of Elforest, are you? That's right! That's why I wanted to work for you so badly. I've been looking forward to meeting you for ages and ages. Hmm, am I laying it on too thick? Yes, you are. Yes, indeed. Well, since Sai told me about the job opportunity, which was last Thursday... <laughs> it's only been three days since then, but I was so excited. It felt like an age. I don't like cleaning very much, if I'm being totally honest, but I know the basics. I can wash dishes and do laundry, and I'm pretty good at cooking. I don't mean to toot my own horn, but my homemade cookies are pretty good. Even Nina thinks so. Cookies? Hijiri blinks. She was doing her best impression of a Jesus statue before, cold and unresponsive, but now I can see definite interest flicker in her eyes. Was I able to get through to her? That's interesting. What about pancakes? Can you make those? Asking the important questions here, huh? Of course, they're like super simple. You only need eggs and milk. I could whip you up some pancakes now if you want to test them. It's no trouble. It's fine. I'll file that tidbit away for future consideration. When Hijiri replies, her voice is cool, her eyes half-lidded. The spark of interest I detected upon her countenance has been snuffed out, like a guttering candle. It's almost as though it never existed. She really is a cool customer. I suppose I appreciate your honesty, if nothing else. But I'm not sure if this is going to work out. You're a bit too enthusiastic for my liking. Can't we drop this, Sai? Thank Takaoka for her time, but tell her it simply won't work. We're too much... we're much too different. Please, Hijiri, don't be like that. You scarcely know Mayo. She's a good girl. Give her a chance. I know enough. She's a fan of Elforest. That speaks volumes. Is that a bad thing? It makes me question her taste, yes. But you're the one who wrote Elforest. Shouldn't you be its number one fan? Of course not. It wouldn't do to get conceited. There's always room for improvement. It doesn't seem like we have much in common. That doesn't bode well for our future cohabitation. We ought to call this off before we can come to blows. I think it's a good thing that you're so dissimilar, personally. You need to have somebody headstrong around, like Mayo, who will whip you into shape. Why does Hijiri need whipping? Oh, you'll find out soon enough if you spend any amount of time with her. 
I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner, Mayo, before dragging you into this, but... Sai looks at me apologetically. Hitiri is something of a shut-in. She almost never goes outside, and she hates talking to people. She keeps odd hours, she doesn't clean up after herself, and she hardly ever eats. I buy her groceries whenever I see her, because I worry about her, but she never makes an effort to use them. The food in her fridge is always weeks, if not months, past its sell-by date. It's no wonder she's so skinny when she lives on a diet of rice crackers and instant noodles. Saya clicks her tongue. She might be an adult, but she's more or less non-functional. I really am worried about her. It's not healthy letting her stay in this big house on her own. I'm terrified that I'll come here one day to find her lying down on her bed, stone cold dead. Ah, uh, yes. Wouldn't that be unfortunate? He did it tuts. You can't let your cash cow snuff it. That would be bad for business, especially with the L4 Stanima coming up. I bet it's going to make a lot of money. That's all I've been hearing for months. Hitchidi. Sai winces. It's not just about the money, you know? So, it's partially about the money then. Partially, yes, but there's more to it than that. Keeping an eye on you is part of my job, but I am genuinely concerned. I hate leaving you here in this tiny village, all on your own. You need to stop pushing people away. If you don't get some human interaction, you'll go crazy. So, that's what you think? He did his eyes. I'm sorry, Sai, but you're mistaken. You don't understand me half as well as you think you do. I can tolerate you, but you're an exception. I don't like people as a rule. It's talking to them that makes me go crazy, not spending time on my own. I quite enjoy my own company. I don't need a housekeeper, and I definitely don't need a babysitter. I'm 28 years old. I do feel bad for dragging you out here, Takaoka, and I'm sorry I punched you in the face, though you're partially to blame for that, but I don't want you here. If you're after my money, you can take it. I'll give you a bunch of cash if you promise to leave me be. No, 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 that won't do at all. Sai slams her palm against Hijiri's table in an uncharacteristic display of agitation. Agitation? I'm not going to let you drive Mayo away. Not that easily. You might need a babysitter, but you do need somebody to keep you on the straight and narrow. Can't you give Mayo a chance? You're asking quite a lot of me. I never thought you'd find somebody crazy enough to live with me in this cruddy village. <laughs> Sai grins. You underestimated my tenacity, Hijiri. Evidently. This is such a nuisance, but... Hijiri exhales. I can tell you're not acting out of malice. You really do seem to care about me, unlike some of the other vultures I have to deal with. I'm not callous enough to throw your efforts back in your face, so... Alright. I'm not happy about this idea, but I can at least give it a try. I'll let Takaoka stay with me for a little while, and I'll see how we get on. Uh huh? Sawa so stares at Hijiri. Her eyes wide. D do you really mean that? Are you really willing to give Mayo a chance? Against my better judgment, yes. Her cleaning skills seem dubious at best, but she shouldn't be completely useless. Not if she's any good in the kitchen. Can you make more than cookies and pancakes, Takaoka? 
Oh, yes, I'm pretty good with meals too. My mom taught me the basics when I was a kid. I can boil rice, make miso soup and prepare a whole bunch of side dishes. Hamburg steak is my specialty. <laughs> I top it with demi glace sauce to make it all shiny and I serve it with veggies. I'm not a big fan of vegetables. Of course she isn't. That explains why those frozen peas were shunted to the back of a freezer for so long. Still sealed. But I do like Hamburg steak. Then I'll make you the best Hamburg steak I can. I'd do anything for you, Hijiri. Except respect my wishes, evidently. I told you not to call me that. Oh, uh, sorry. It, it was a slip of the tongue. I meant to say Komikado. <laughs> that tongue of yours does seem awfully loose. You'd best be careful, or it might get you into trouble. Still... If we're going to live together, even for a child period, you might as well dispense with the formalities. You can call me Hijiri, and I'll call you Mayo. Is that alright? Of course it's alright. It's alright, you don't even need to ask. Ah, oh, jeez. I'm so happy. I think I can feel grateful tears beating in the corners of my eyes. I've been accepted by Hijiri. From this day forth, I'm going to live under the same roof as my idol. I'll have to shelf my wish for world peace right now. My bigger, more important wish has come true, despite the bumps and bruises I sustained for it, and I wouldn't want to ask too much else of the universe. It might sound like an exaggeration, but I'm being earnest when I say that this really is the best day of my life. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. That was somewhat of a lot. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I think I'm going to stop here for today. Um, yeah. I'm struggling a bit with the voices because um, I do want to do them a bit differently, but for girl characters that, I don't know, I also don't want to overdo it. <laughs> I don't want it to be too comical with the voices and then I'm not too used to, yeah, like voicing characters, oh my god. Um, but yeah, that was fun. And of course, UTD is not quite what Mayo expected, is she? That was to be expected by us. Um, still find that strange why I couldn't just drive her there, but okay. Whatever. She's there now. She found the place eventually and they going to start working together or Mayu for her. But we're going to check that out next time. Until then, I hope you enjoy today and until next time. Bye bye!